Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of Compassion and Courage Conversations in Healthcare. I'm your host, Marcus Engel, and this is the podcast that teaches compassionate communication, provides perspective, and inspires resilience. I've got to tell y'all, a couple of months ago, I was speaking at a at a international conference here in Orlando, and I got to meet a brother from another mother. And if it, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you've ever uh, been thought of like that, Dr. Nate, but uh, Dr. Nate Regeer, thank you so much for being with me today. You are so welcome. I love that. I've heard it before and only special people use that with me. So that means a lot. Because you are the host of a podcast that also has compassion in the name. And I was like, there's a very small percentage of us podcasters that would be using that word. So that's why I felt safe in throwing that brother from another mother reference out there. Oh, yeah. How long have you been doing your podcast now? Let's see. I'm entering my third year. Third I year. do once Excellent. a month. And so, yeah, we're getting up there over 40 episodes now. Awesome. Awesome. And I suppose I should tell our listeners that you are a PhD, so a psychologist. You formerly practiced clinical psychology, right? I did. Yeah, I'm kind of in recovery now. (laughs) And now um, you uh, have headed up and founded Next Element Consulting, Mm -hmm. right? And that's an organization that brings more compassion into the workplace. So this is why our work is so aligned and I'm, I'm excited to get to talk to you today. Yeah, absolutely. And, and when I heard you speak at that conference, I just felt like we have got to connect because we're barking up the same tree and trying to share the same message. So I guess that brings about the question, how did you come to this work? How did you, how did you come to clinical psychology? Uh, how did you come to work in this specific area of compassion and helping organizations find more compassion, compassionate accountability, I believe is a term yeah. that you use, right? You know, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm uncovering, discovering the answer to that question every day. And I know that the seeds were planted early in life. My parents were missionaries in Africa with the Mennonite church. And so I grew up running around in Africa in a very rural setting around all kinds of different things and didn't even realize at the time the powerful influence that my parents were going to have on me. They lived the principles of compassionate accountability as missionaries. Um, But I also then in high school was exposed to a ton of unrest, civil unrest, violence, apartheid living in Southern Africa. And and it was a whole different experience where there was just tons of conflict and violence and saw my parents operate in that kind of a setting too. Um, But growing up pacifist, uh, Mennonites are kind of pacifist, you know, uh, by, by theology. And so this idea of how do you turn the other cheek when you want to confront injustice and problems. And, and when there's conflict, how do we do this? And uh, so it's something I've been wrestling with my whole life and compassion accountability just kind of kept emerging as this is the thing. And we have to find ways to help leaders do that. Wow. So you were seeing stuff at a young age that most of us never witness, right? I mean, most yeah. of us growing up in the Western world, we're not witnessing uh, mass violence, group attacks, right? That's, that's not in our wheelhouse. That no. seems uh, like they really needed some pacifists around for examples. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, at first I thought pacifism is just don't ever, you know, I was always told never resort to violence, no matter what. But I also observed in the culture, in the churches where people would resort to passive aggressive attacks and the silent treatment and and people were violent to each other. They just weren't raising a hand. And I thought there's got to be a better way because relationships have to have something richer than that and more meaningful than that. We can't just say because we're not hurting each other physically that we're that we're okay. Um, but yeah, and how, how do you, how do you confront injustice? How do you talk about these really difficult issues in a way that preserves the dignity of everybody involved when you really would just rather erase them from the face of the earth, um, and pretend they're not there? Deep questions, right? Mm -hmm. Deep questions. And maybe that's for another day because we could certainly go off on um, many tangents here, but I, I want to bring 
the, the, the conversation back around to compassionate accountability. We're talking about this as, as almost a, a human thing, right? We're all human. We all move away from out of alignment of ourselves. And when we really are compassionate people at our core, but we, we get out of alignment, right? Yeah. We all get yeah. burnt out. So, so give me a little idea of, of how you do this and what you do with an organization that needs to, uh, how shall we say, inject some yeah. compassion into their, into their workforce and really see the benefits of compassion. Yeah. You know, the first thing we do, and this is the first compassionate thing to do, is acknowledge the experience, acknowledge the struggle. And the struggle that so many organizations have is, is this perceived tension between compassion and accountability. Nobody would argue that it's good to be kind. It's good to be compassionate. We should care about our fellow human beings. And nobody would disagree that accountability matters. We have to do what we say we're going to do and we have to get the job done, right? I mean, we're, we're here to serve our customers, our patients. But, but most people think those two can't coexist. Like somehow you have to choose or you have to pick one or the other. And so there's this endless pendulum that seems to be going back and forth and, and people seem to either settle on one end or the other, or they just pick one on a given day and then they just vacillate. That is a really, really hard place to be because if you, if you choose compassion without accountability, you get nowhere. But if you choose accountability without compassion, you get alienated. You, you, you can't have one without the other. So that's the first thing we do is just acknowledge this is a really hard place to be and we need a better way. We need to push through to, to an understanding of compassion that encompasses both and gives us a way to be in that space and use that tension as, some, as a creative force instead of a destructive force. A creative force instead of a destructive force. I, I know that there's a lot of people that use terms like fierce compassion yeah. <laughs> and, and I feel like that, that, that certainly plays into what we, what we want to do is just create a world that's more inclusive, mm. belo- a sense of belonging. Yeah. How do you do that when I'm going to assume that much like in, in therapy and clinical practice that, by the time a person comes to a counselor or psychologist for the first time, they probably should have been there a year ago, Yeah, right? People come in after a crisis. Is that the same thing that you see with organizations that they're in a crisis before they ever reach out to you? And if so, how do you, how do you yeah. walk back that crisis? We see two kinds. That is one where they're really struggling, they're looking for help, they're desperate. Maybe maybe their customer service or patient scores are so bad that they're th- they're risking not being reaccredited or something they have to change. Or we also get people coming to us that have have in a way they've seen a vision for what's possible and they get it at some level, they just don't know how to get there. And so they want to go from good to great. They they they're on the right track. They just don't know how to break through. And in either case, we, we've kind of researched and tried to figure out what are the behavioral characteristics or mindset of people that can do this, that can hold that tension and create with it. And so that's where we've discovered that the, the compassion accountability really starts with a compassion mindset. You have to view yourself and other people in a very particular kind of right way before you can, because otherwise your behaviors will, <laughs> will follow. Hmm. It's difficult to it's difficult to be uh, that person who's always in that compassionate mindset, right? Yeah. I, I I often use the one of the definitions for compassion as non judgmental awareness. Yes, but we're always judging, right? We're yeah. always judging, like this this chair is too hard, or it's too <laughs> hot in this room, or yeah. uh, that person smells, right? Yeah, we're, yeah. we're always observing. And it seems like if we could assign no judgment to experiences, maybe that would help us stay in a little more compassionate mindset. Well, and that's a big part of self-compassion practices, mindfulness practices, to be with things without judging them. And I think there's maybe another step, which is 
it, it's a permission that I give myself every day and I invite anyone who's in the, in the helping space that it's okay to want someone to learn and grow without expecting them to. And I think that's a really powerful thing because wanting means we desire, we exert effort, we, 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 want, we go for it, right? Expecting means that if it doesn't happen, somebody's not okay or our identity is somehow wrapped up in the outcome rather than in the process. And so when we teach our kind of what we call the three switches of the compassion mindset, each one of those is about how do we want without expecting and, and create movement. That's positive. How do you do that? Well, it it starts with recognizing there's three aspects of our human existence that that are all about compassion. Uh, the first one is the switch of value that humans are inherently valued by virtue of being human. And when we have that switch turned on inside, we see them as unconditionally valuable. When the switch is turned off, we see their value as conditional on anything from background to education, to skin color, to physical ability, to gender affiliation, whatever that is. Um, and so we think we can treat them as less than, and we other them. The second switch is the switch of capability. The humans are not just valuable. We're also agentic beings. We, we do stuff. We figure things out. We are, we're creative. And so when that switch is on, we treat people as capable, which means that we invite them into the process of problem solving. We get them included. We invest in them. We, we, we put forth what we have to offer. And, and we, we collaborate on fixing this stuff. And then the third switch is the switch of responsibility. The humans are not just valuable. They're not just capable. We are also responsible because we coexist and therefore our behaviors matter. They impact each other and we have to have contracts and promises and agreements with each other about how we're going to be. And when that switch is turned on, we take 100% responsibility for just our own crap and no more and no less. And we ask others to do the same. And so those three switches are really kind of the foundational premise for all the behavior that follows. And then, and then we work on particular strategies to keep our switches on. Fascinating. Fascinating. And, and, and how, do, how do audiences, how do organizations receive this when you're, when you're sharing this with, say, middle managers at any organization, yeah. whether it's healthcare or not? How, how is it received? We found some patterns. There's the, the literature is really clear that the value switch, which is, is the one that creates psychological safety and emotional safety. And when that one's on, it changes everything. It's the foundation. But when it's off, it, it creates the problem so many cultures are dealing with, which is lack of emotional, psychological, interactional safety. So that's the biggest aha is, wow, we really have to stop and be with each other in those moments. And treat each other with care and concern and empathy first before we get down to the business of our work, whatever that is. So that's a big aha and, and a big struggle for organizations. That's the, the first one. The second thing is they is what we call a phenomenon of rescuing. And this is so true in the helping professions is smart, capable people that have solved this problem a million times are trying to help someone else who hasn't. And we do that in a way that undermines their dignity and their capability. And it's called rescuing. We, we, we come in without permission to help people and we try to foist our ideas and our solutions on them without their collaboration and participation. And it just doesn't go well. Even as smart as we are, that's great, but, but it violates essential human dignity when we help without consent um, on the day-to-day -day kinds of things that we do. Those are two really big ahas that when people start to fix that, things can really change. So, so going back to the first point there, you said how to be with, yeah. right? How to be with, and you know, my story and you know, the, the story of Jennifer holding my hand yeah. in the ER and saying, I'm here. Yeah. And, and I, I'll ask you the question that I ask every guest to reflect on, which is, can you think of a time in your life when you have been with someone who is suffering or someone has been with you when you were suffering? Do you have a, do you have a, a narrative that contains that, that? Yeah. Feeling? Um, I don't tell the story very often at all, but, um, my, my family and I were coming home from, a 
from a volleyball tournament in an, in a local town, my daughter and my wife and I, and we were driving a, a back road that we go all the time, a shortcut back to our home. And it was dark, it was dark. And we came upon a motorcycle accident and we were the first people on the scene, maybe the second, because we saw um, a young Amish woman just standing sh in shock, just looking at the accident and couldn't move. But we were the first on the scene. And so I got out of my car and went to see what was going on. And there, there were two people, two women who, who, who had both been thrown off the motorcycle. Um, one of them seemed to be completely unconscious and no very, very, very bad injuries. And then I saw another body and, and this person seemed to be conscious, but in shock. And I decided to be with her until EMS arrived. And so I held her hand and, and was trying to keep her conscious, but also keep her from moving just in case, you know, there were spinal injuries, um, head injuries and trying to learn all I could about what was going on. So I could be helpful whenever the EMTs arrived and she would come in out of consciousness and in and out of the shock, but just being there every time she would try to move, I would just squeeze her hand harder and she would calm down and she would come back and, and connect. Um, I learned later that her partner died and she survived. I've never seen her again. I've never met her, but when the EMTs arrived, I was able to kind of download whatever I thought I knew and had learned and just get out of there and make, make space for them. But, um, that was a, both a traumatic moment, but a very special moment too, about just being with someone in that moment. I don't know what difference it made, but I, hopefully it kept her from moving or something that may have, may have made it worse. Um, I'm going to imagine she does have some kind of memory from that experience, even if it's bits and pieces. And I have to think that you were such a comforting presence. I want to go back to what you said at the beginning of the story that, that you got on scene and there was an Amish woman observing the wreck. Was she involved in the no, wreck? As not well? at all. No, not that I know there. of, not that I know of, unless, unless they maybe swerved to avoid her, but right. it was on a curve and she was just there. I think she had approached it and just knew that I don't know what to do, but I can't leave either. I need to just be here. And so she was just there. Um, yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, wow. And, and the, the other person on the motorcycle deceased yeah. on the, on the road there. Mm. Yeah. Wow. There's, there, there's so many things that we can do just, it's, it's not rocket science, right? It's not rocket science. Just being yeah. with somebody. Yeah. Do you want a story of when someone was there for me also? Yeah, or? sure. I'd love to hear that. Um, you know, I mentioned to you that I, I was around a lot of violence in South Africa and we lived in Botswana and w in the town of Habaroni, which was the capital city, just a 20 miles from the border with South Africa. And uh, Botswana was the only functioning black democracy in Africa at the time. So it harbored a lot of political, uh, political refugees. And so from time to time, the South African government would come in and try to get these people who were hiding. But one night, the South African military actually raided the city and um, found and killed, I think, 18 or 20 political refugees in the same night. And one of them lived just two doors down from us. And so we heard the whole thing happening. We were, I remember standing by my window of my parents holding the burglar bars and, and seeing how white my knuckles were. And my father was, was behind me holding me. And after all the gunshots stopped and the, and the, the military vehicle drove away, we thought it was done, but then the bomb went off that they had planted. And about a minute later, a piece of roofing just fell outside our window right in front of the house. And, but my dad and I both looked at each other and we said, there's, what if there's someone still alive? We need to go. And so we went to the scene and we're kind of looking through the rubble and we found, we found the body of our neighbor, a good friend, his, his nickname was Red. And he was a, he was a poet and a, an author who had been exiled and he had been shot and killed. But my father was with me. I remember being scared, but also feeling like this is where we have to be no matter what happens. And this is what we got to do is just go be. Um, 
we're not going to stop them. We're not going to fix it. We're not going to retaliate. We just have to be. Um, and we were there and, you know, we didn't find anybody alive. We came back to our house and then within like two or three hours, the local police were disarming another bomb that was in the living room where we had walked through. Um, so we were grateful to be alive. Um, but I remember the strength of my father and the presence of, we can be scared and we can still go and be present in those moments. Mm. Mm. Again, most people have no concept of what that is like, right? Most people would have no concept of what, <laughs> I, I just think if, if uh, two doors down, a house for me blew up. Yeah. I don't know if, I, I think my first, I would hope my first instinct is to go help. Yeah. I, with everything else going on though, with all the unrest and killings, I might just lock my doors and stay inside. I'm not proud of that fact. Well, <laughs> but, yeah. Um, and that's our, yeah. that's our lucky, normal, safe lives we live in. And so in a way, maybe this gives a little bit of compassion for what people are going through in Ukraine right now, where this is a daily occurrence or in war torn countries. And, um, just, I can't imagine what it would be like to live with that every day. How old yeah. were you when that experience happened? I was a junior in high school. I was 17. Okay. So you're old enough to be oh, yeah. you know, pretty much a full grown man at that point. And, and wow, wow. Yeah. That's either way. That's still a lot for a 17 year old kid to be witnessing. Wow. Well, when we think about compassion, and especially in the world of healthcare, we know that these days it, it's it's hard to have compassion when you are so busy and running from patient to patient. And I'm specifically yeah. thinking about nurses on the floor and techs and therapists that are working in hospitals. Yeah. How do we how do we practice that kind of compassion? when our time is so short? Mm. It's, it is the question. And I remember you said it another way when you were on my podcast, you said nurses don't grow on trees and we don't have an unlimited budget. We can't just manufacture the solution. Um, and probably even if we could, it would get filled just like air fills space and we would be back right where we found ourselves. So there just has to be a different way of being in those moments. Um, and so usually the first thing we, we, we want to do in the situation is look for pockets of drama and miscommunication. Where are we having interactions that are either wasteful in terms of our emotional, mental, psychological energy, or maybe they're accomplishing nothing that's productive. So those, those interactions maybe are serving more to feel justified or to cover our bases or to somehow protect our identity. And, and, and over time, we accumulate those kind of like barnacles on a ship where there's all these things that we are doing and saying that we've never, we don't question anymore, but they're just all this baggage that weighs us down that is really not essential to what's going on. So we take a look at that. And sometimes people can shed some things very quickly and have a little bit of extra weight. Um, but then we go to kind of what Dr. Stephen Treziak in his book, Compassionomics and, and Mazzarelli, such an incredible book, talks about how when we, we think that the solution is to back away, give ourselves more time, disengage, you know, take a break, take a breather. And that's more a function of burnout where we're actually starting to depersonalize and we can't be good healthcare providers if we start depersonalizing. So Ironically, the solution is actually to lean into the relationship with real compassion, where we're taking constructive steps to be with people towards a constructive solution. Um, and we feel we, we get back to feeling like a healing machine, um, which is what we're there to do is heal. Um, and so when people can lean in with different strategies to engage differently and connect in more meaningful ways and join the patient in the struggle, join the nurse manager in the struggle, um, join the physician towards an outcome, they start to have this energy of feeling more fulfilled, more purposeful again. And now all of a sudden it hurts so good instead of I'm drained. Mm. Uh, it's not that they're working hard, less hard. It's that the, it, it's having purpose and meaning again, and it's achieving outcomes that they can see and feel. You, you threw down a great line there, which was we get back to being a healing machine. I love it. 
I love it. We get back to being a healing machine. And I think that's what so many people want to do and would like to uh, envision themselves doing. Sometimes though, as, as we all know, we can be, pardon the, pardon the reference, but we can be blind to our own selves, right? We can yeah, be, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm no different than anyone else. I, I, the things that I complain about or I'm oblivious to in my, in other right. people, I, I'm oblivious right. about in myself. Um, and, and so th- the work that you're talking about really helps people not only provide more compassion to their, to their patients and their coworkers, but then that is a, a journey into self as well, right? Into our own yeah. identity. Yeah. How, how do yeah. you see that manifest? How does that break through whenever there's the aha moment um, with this training? Great question. Really good. And it, it comes back to the fundamental truth that um, it all starts inside of us. The journey is not with the other people at first. The journey is with ourselves. And um, Wayne Dyer has a famous quote that I love. He said that when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And uh, I just got to say that again, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. So when people say, well, how can I fix those things out there? We say, well, change how you look at them, Mm -hmm. change how you look at yourself. And then the things out there will change. They'll take care of themselves. And um, so that journey inward often occurs either because people want to make it first or while they're trying to change the behaviors that we're guiding them on, they, they hit roadblocks. And those roadblocks are all internal. Like when we prevent someone from giving unsolicited advice for the first time, they can hardly contain themselves. And it's so hard for them not to just push their idea. And in the process of restraining, they have to now face their own ego, their own need for validation, their own fear of feeling incompetent, not needed and all of that. And once they deal with that stuff, all of a sudden they're free. Um, And so that inner journey is... Is where most of the work happens. Wow. Wow. The inner journey. Yeah. Wow. So this is, so I, I also want to highlight a paper that you wrote, uh, that some summarize some of these things and it was the, the compassion crisis in healthcare. Yeah. I, there were, there were many things that I, that I took away from, uh, that bit and, uh, what it comes back to is that we just, got to keep intentionally mindfully doing it right you can't get trained in it once and learn it but not practice it you've got to do it and the more you do it the more you do it right i yes i I always think of that thing with meditation is the more you do it the more you do it uh and i think it, it works with compassion and healthcare too don't you think Absolutely. And, and, you know, our, our definition of compassion is compassion is the practice of demonstrating that people are valuable, capable, and responsible in every interaction. So it is the practice of demonstrating it's a practice, but the practice is not just of thinking about it. We have to be demonstrating it and, and putting in the reps every day. We're demonstrating that people are valuable, capable, and responsible when every interaction and this this is a way of being. It's it, it is a way of life, um, and so it, every day we keep doing it. Keep showing up, right? Yep. It's in the returning. It's it in is. the returning. But there's a myth, though. Real quick, I just you know there's a lot of barriers to people doing this. Maybe they say, "Well, compassion is soft. We're in a hard business." Or compassion. Some people have it. Some people don't. I'm not Mother Teresa, so I can't learn it. Or Compassion is just for selfless servant leaders, you know, and so there's all these myths and misconceptions that we need to tackle in order to, for people to break through to the really transformative, hard, cutting edge, fierce compassion that changes lives. Well, you have given me a few new perspectives and when we get a different perspectives, our life changes. And so thank you for all your perspectives and insights and uh, pointers today. You're so welcome. Uh, the, the feeling is mutual. I, I think these kinds of conversations are so good for 
for peeling back onions and breaking open nuts and anything else that happens. <laughs> Whatever metaphor we choose to, yeah. to use, right? Yeah. Well, in the time we have left here, can I, uh, can I throw a couple of random questions by you? You bet. Okay. So this first question might be a little bit of an interesting one because of, of where you grew up and when you grew up. But I, I ask my guests to reflect back to when they were 16 years old and they were being with their friends, they're hanging out with friends after school, um, might have been very different for you hanging out in Botswana at 16, mm. 17 years old. But what, I'm going to ask the question anyway, even though you probably weren't riding around after sports practice in your yeah. friend's car, but what, do you remember what music you were listening to when you were 16 years old? Yeah, actually, maybe I wasn't driving around in, in the car, but I was at the tennis courts. I played on the Botswana national tennis team, junior tennis team, and I practiced all the time. And that's where we were. And the music we played was all of the great 80s music. Uh, Duran Duran, uh, uh, Michael Jackson, Madonna. That's what I remember. That's what I was hitting balls to. That's yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, growing up as a, I wasn't quite 16 in the mid eighties, uh, at that time, but boy, did that music sink into my being and my psyche, <laughs> even to this day. I, 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 there's a really wonderful book you may be ex, uh, experienced with called this is your brain on music. And it's, it's a great look at, at how, um, where we are in our development stages when we're learning music and how often we, mm. We don't start enjoying a lot of new music yes. past 25 or 30 years old. I know that's the same way with uh, me. Luckily, I spent a lot of yes. my life listening to music growing up that uh, that there's a lot to pick from in the old memory bank. Oh, my so. gosh. My wife and I talk about our memories. They're so rich. I remember the, the boom box and the Billy Joel cassette, and I would replay those songs over and over and over in my bedroom. And it was just, it's indelible in there. And those, those tunes come on. I can sing those words like, mm. like and, and it, it's visceral. It's way down deep in there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the art. Oh, but, yeah. And so that, that kind of leads me to my, my next question, which is a little thought experiment. Okay. And if you are, if you are uh, stranded on the proverbial desert Island, but yet you would get to keep uh, one piece of artistic, expression with you, whether it's a book or a film or a piece of visual art or hmm. a Broadway production, an album, what is a piece of, or, or another way to ask this question is what is a piece of art that really speaks to you? It would probably be music and I could narrow it down to a couple albums that uh, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, I, I think probably Queen, Queen's album mm -hmm. Hot Space might be might be the one there. There's so much there that uh, reminds me of the things that bring me joy and connect mm -hmm. me to memories that I would want to have if I was on a desert island without those people. Um, and I just have an, I'm fascinated with Queen and that that whole story in their their group. And the fact that, you know, Brian May can not only play great, <laughs> great, but he can also teach you about uh, astrophysics. A lot of, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. I yeah. sometimes ask I, myself, if I could see a movie for the first time again, it would be that one, the Queen movie probably. Mm. But I can never see it for the first time again. But if I could, I would probably do that. Nice. <laughs> nice. Have you, uh, have you by chance seen the Elton John? Yes. Yes. Wonderful piece of art. Really good also. Mm. Wow. Wow. Well, so for my final question, I'm sure we could sit here and talk music mm. all day. Yeah, but yeah. last question for you is, if you had the world's largest billboard on top of the world's highest mountain, what is the message that you would broadcast to humanity? It's a phrase... Um, Here's what I would say. It's it's in my new book, a couple places. I've been saying it for a couple years, but here's what it is. Compassion is what makes us human. It's what brings us together. And it's what gets us back on track when we lose our way. 
Mm. Compassion is what makes us human. Rem tell me the rest of that. It's Compassion what makes us human. Makes us human. It's what brings us together. And it's what gets us back on track when we lose our way. Gets us back on track when we lose our way. Um, what a, what a great thing. Tell, tell me about your book a little bit. Oh, Compassionate Accountability is the name of it. And it's kind of, it, it, I've written four books and this one is kind of the prequel and the culmination of all of the work we've done at Next Element over the last 15 years on really refining the mindset, the skill set, and the implementation plan for organizations that want to bring this into their cultures and create cultures where people can build connection and get things done. And we love to get things done, especially when it gets back down to the heart of all of us, mm -hmm. which is compassion and um, our empathy and our kindness to humanity, yeah. to humanity. And I'm so glad that, that, that you joined me today. Thank you so much for, for being here. You are welcome. Um, thank you for being a friend. Thank you for being so open hearted and open minded. When I walked up to you at that book line, uh, I'll always remember that. Uh, well, I, I was I was glad to meet you, of course. And then when you asked me to be a guest on your podcast, I was like, absolutely, absolutely. Any kind of conversations I can have with this guy, uh, this guy that's the brother from another, another mother. mother. I love it. <laughs> Great. Well, Dr. Nate Regeer, thank you so much for, for being with me today on the podcast. And uh, thank you for, for all the information and for the work that you do. Audience, thank you for being with me on Compassion and Courage, Conversations in Healthcare. This is the podcast where I teach compassionate communication, provide perspective, and inspire resilience. Thank you to everyone who continues to subscribe and rate and review and share the podcast. We really, really appreciate your help getting the word out there. And we will see you all again next time on the next episode of Compassion and Courage. Thank you.